When George Washington became the first president of the United States, the country stretched down the East Coast from Maine to Georgia and westward from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River. Many people thought it was just too big to be a republic, but already there were those who saw the United States extending all the way to the Pacific Ocean. The federal government was initially located in New York City, already the nation's commercial hub. New York City was, even then, a densely packed, fast-paced community of deal-makers, viewed with both suspicion and envy by the rest of the country. A vortex of folly and dissipation, which swallows up simple Republican virtues. What were people complaining about? Not enough housing, rents are too high, S city streets are too dirty, too much prostitution, sin and gambling, uh, too many bars, too much theft, crime. Everything that you hear now, you heard in 1789. All the positive things are exactly the same as well. Excitement, opportunity, diversity, the constant stimulation of the senses, a sense that this is where the world is, this is where it's happening. New York City boasted one of the nation's first abolitionist societies, led by Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and Aaron Burr. But New York had always been a center of the slave trade, and the concentration of slaves per capita in some parts of the Hudson Valley equaled that of Tidewater, South Carolina. A week's journey south of New York, the center of southern economy and culture was indisputably Charleston. Like New York, Charleston was relatively pluralistic, with communities of Jews and Catholics as well as Protestants, slaves, slave owners, and free blacks. Recent immigrants and an affluent leadership, comprised mostly of lawyers, merchants, and planters. The wealthy were about one-fifth of the white population and they controlled about five-eighths of the wealth and they were an exclusively tied intermarried group of, of English, some French Huguenot extracted families who dominated society, dominated politics and dominated the economy. They were fed in turn by other classes, by a small merchant class, a mechanics class of tradesmen and then of course by a, a majority African population. Furniture, craftsmen, brick masons, joiners, silversmiths employed slaves and slave artisans in their workshops. Eventually a number of these crafts came to be dominated by blacks. Some were able to buy their freedom in the late years of the 18th century and this initial foundation created a free black artisanry population in the city that was fairly substantial. Black history is so rich in Charleston, so rich in Charleston, it is impossible to move from A to Z in Charleston, any street, an inch of Charleston, without including something that blacks did. Blacks built Charleston. You know, we made the bricks, the old bricks that you see here. We did everything. The city of Charleston was known for its beauty and culture, but the Carolina backcountry was a different world. The majority of whites lived not as planters, but as small farmers, eking a living off the land in a semi-subsistence barter economy. In the early 1790s, few European Americans had yet ventured beyond the Appalachians, but with the population almost doubling every 20 years, land-hungry young families began pushing in ever greater numbers into Indian lands. The five so-called civilized tribes, the Creeks, Cherokees, Chickasaws, Choctaws, and Seminoles, continued for the moment to dominate their ancient homelands, even as they adopted certain aspects of European culture. In the Ohio Valley, Native American residents resisted intrusions from the United States. Many allied themselves with the English, who still manned forts in the Great Lakes region. Beyond U.S. borders, Spain held vast claims in the interior of the continent, and since 1763 had controlled access to the Mississippi River at New Orleans. 
St. Louis, a small village founded by the French, was still little more than a trading outpost. Now, there's a wonderful founding myth about the city of St. Louis, which has to do with a 14-year-old boy by the name of Auguste Chouteau, who showed up here with a crew of men uh, who worked for a man by the name of Pierre Lecled, who was more than, a, more than simply an acquaintance of Auguste Chouteau's, but in fact, uh, much to the scandal of the early French re residents, was uh, really involved with Auguste's mother. Located in the center of the continent, at the confluence of its two most important waterways, St. Louis was poised to become a hub for east-west travel and trade. In 1790, the Spanish governed St. Louis loosely, giving generous land grants that attracted many settlers. It's also a very freewheeling society on the frontier. Uh, you find all kinds of relationships possible that in a more settled and civilized community would not be tolerated. So for example, Auguste Chouteau's mother and Pierre Lecled lived together for years in the midst of this community, never, never being married. A situation that uh, certainly would have pulled them out of the ranks of the first family uh, in the American period. South and west of St. Louis, Santa Fe had also grown into an active and diverse frontier community. There are about 500 Pueblo people living in Santa Fe. And in 1790, there, there's a very interesting dynamic um, and dynamical relationship between the um, Pueblo population and the Spanish colonists. They're actively involved in trading, in building, in exchange networks. The Spanish colonists and the Pueblos are in, united in terms of, of um, military powers as well, trying to defend the stronghold from Comanches and Apaches and Navajo Indians that are living on the periphery. Moving west, the Pacific coastal region was still dominated by Indian peoples in 1790. What we had in this area, in what is called today San Francisco, uh, were a group of small independent uh, Indian villages, uh, generally between 50 and 200 people. The Europeans came in in California in 1769. By uh, 1772, they realized that this is one of the great harbors, one of the great bays in the world. And so in 1776, Spanish put two settlements here in order to guard that bay and to begin the European settlement of this area. The two settlements you would have found is a presidio, uh, which is a Spanish word for fort. The second was a mission, uh, the sixth in a chain of 21 California missions uh, started by Spain. It was called Mission San Francisco de Assis, St. Francis of Assisi, popularly called Mission Dolores, an adobe church with an adobe quadrangle off to one side. And around it, you would have seen uh, the Thule grass homes of the Indians who had converted. Because the part and parcel of Spanish exploration and colonization, I should say, of, uh, of its territories was to evangelize the natives to Christianity. About 600 miles north of San Francisco lay the serene Willamette Valley, where the city of Portland would eventually emerge. At that time, no one yet from the eastern part of the continent had trekked overland to this part of the world. So if you came here, it would be a great wooded area, lots of forests, fir forests, very rugged coastline, inaccessible, often stormy, foggy, very much a contested part of the world. The Spanish, the Russians, French, Americans, British, all sailing up and down the coast here, uh, trading with uh, Native Americans of the Northwest tribes for furs, sea otter, beaver. The Indian peoples of the Pacific Northwest govern their lives largely in the traditions of their ancestors. But back in New York City, and a world away, the founders of the United States had few traditions to fall back on as they prepared to launch their new Republican government. 